Hello everyone, my name is Matt Gillick for BookTrib.com, presenting 15 Minutes with Mr. Sam Sheeran. This is a Meryl Moss Media production. I'm here with a dark artist as well as a well-renowned um, uh, cover album artist. His name is Mr. Sam Sheeran and he uh, comes out with his new holiday book called A Creepy Christmas, A Merry Macabre Coloring Book. And I'm very interested to talk with him and I'm very glad that he's here. Thank you so much for joining us, Sam. Hey, Matt Gillick. Absolute honor to be talking to you, too. Pleasure to meet you. <laughs> Thank you so much. So I'm just going to get right into it. So there's a lot of interesting folklore that surrounds Christmas, and mm. you decided to make a coloring book about it. But you have a kind of a very twisted look behind it, where having a lot of uh, gothic, horrific, terrible things. So there is this one particular character named Krampus that a lot of people might have heard about, but they really don't know the background. So for mm. all those people who laymen might not know, who is Krampus and why did you want to make such an interesting coloring book about centered around this Christmas lore? Um, that's a great question. And it's, uh, I'm going to try and keep it very simple because it's quite a layered answer. There's so many different aspects to the side of uh, Christmas in general being a, a darker season than Halloween. Um, as everyone sort of says, you know, what's your favorite season? Everybody tends to say, you know, autumn or the fall or, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and, you know, hang on, my phone alarm's going off. <laughs> um, and so, you know, Halloween, it is it is everybody's favorite. But doing the research on Christmas, I found it to be far darker and far creepier and so many more stories than Halloween in terms of monsters and all kinds of different creatures and things. But Krampus, um, truth be known, no one really knows the true origin, um, but Christianity stole it in a sense. Like, you know, most modern religions have sort of cobbled together other things that worked in the past. And Krampus was a character that stems from uh, pagan and pagan prehistory. There are all these different... Uh, stories of goat people and, and demons and monsters of the woods and unknown creatures in the woods, which stem from stories of wild men and things like that. And that's a whole new avenue. But uh, they would talk about if you're bad at Christmas or misbehaved, this creature would accompany St. Nicholas. <laughs> and he, he would then, that was his job to take the naughty children away or burn them or drown them or eat them. So Krampus is kind of, in modern days today, I mean, there's movies about it now. It's it's always this sort of singular character. And it is kind of a, a main effigy, this main sort of uh, Christian devil, in a sense. It has been a, and much like the Christian devil stole from Pan and, and the pagan goat gods and things like that to sort of stigmatize those religions and make them appear evil, which they really obviously weren't. But the Christian devil, Krampus, was an immediate obvious route for people to say, well, we'll use that figure. So no one really knows where it came from, but it's all across Europe. Um, but Krampus isn't isn't one, it's actually pl plural. It's uh, it's the Krampus, which means there's several of them. There's many, many of them. And in, you see these in parades and things across Europe, you know, Krampus Love, the Krampus Run, on Krampus Nacht, to <laughs> the Krampus Night, uh, December the 5th, and then December the 6th all day. You have many, many people dressed up as all different types of Krampus. Mm -hmm. So it's not just one, it's it's many, which is far more terrifying than just having one, you know. That's that's really interesting because I never knew that like I thought Krampus would like give them coal or something like that. I had no idea that uh, Saint Nicholas would instruct <laughs> his his little minion to eat these children. It seems uh seems like quite a bit of overkill so given all like this dark nature about like around christmas and like the are you like a fan of the holiday season <laughs> with uh, christmas in particular or do you kind of like want to pull back the lid on uh some of these uh commercialized happy-go-lucky oh it's just santa claus and rudolph and all that stuff actually that that's um that's a great question because you know, as a, as a child, everybody loves Christmas, of course, you know, for, who have grown up in a Western culture that have that, you know, Santa Claus, the red and the green, uh, all the modern, as you say, commercial aspects of Christmas is sort of thrown down your neck after so many years. And then you grow up and you do become sick of it because you realize it is just a marketing gimmick to make money, which is really sad. So 
to to be in love with Christmas and, and and really enjoy what Christmas means and the true meaning of Christmas, I decided through you know the research, you know, how can I start to remind people of what it was really all about? And if you look at all the old legends, they really were sort of uh, folk tales and old wives' tales to ensure people were warm at the winter or they had enough food so they would create these devils and these monsters so that the harvests were done in time and uh, people would make new clothes otherwise a giant cat will eat them <laughs> and again you know children were told about these monsters in the woods so that they didn't wander off in the snow and so the real meaning of christmas was about community and and scaring people into action and making sure everybody looked after each other and i think today if people um I mean, I believe in monsters, but if people don't believe in monsters, they should at least adopt those, you know, traditional values again. Because I think it's it's not about money or how much you spend. It's not about what you get. It's whatever you can give and look after everybody else. And I think uh, monsters really lend that to the sort of idea of, you know, you, you've got to look out for people because there's there's a lot of sadness and awful things in the world. Yeah, including those monsters. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Truth. Um, so my next question is, what was your, when you were researching this, um, uh, when you found all these stories um, uh, to make this coloring book, what was your favorite kind of like dark or particularly sinister fun fact about Christmas that really kind of like said, I had no idea that this was, this was a cultural thing? Um, God, there's so many, there's so many. Um, I mean, everything from from mistletoe itself, uh, you know, reading about that and doing the research on mistletoe, you know, we all just sort of think, oh, you kiss someone underneath it and it's maybe it's lucky or something. No one really knows what it's all about. But doing the research on the plant itself, the plant is a parasite mm. and it almost acts like a vampire and it feeds off other trees and other other plants and it sucks the all the hard work and the photosynthesis that other plants do. The, the mistletoe will actually feed off it as a parasite. And when you look at the act of kissing someone, you know, you're sharing breath and there's, there's a lot of uh, vampiric undertones with that and sexuality and, and the whole sort of uh, ownership and dominance and that kind of thing. And so mistletoe is almost woven into that whole ironic reality that that's exactly what it's all about. Um, and then from that all the way through to, you know, literal devils and monsters and giant trolls in Norway that hide in inside mountains and, and in the fog. And, and if you ring a church bell, it scares them away. And, you know, uh, just so many things that I didn't even know about. And, and I've grown up being a huge fan of the unexplained, huge fascination with natural history and, and super nature, if you want to look at it that way, cryptozoology, the search for hidden animals. And yet there were things that I had never even heard of, um, which... You know, all over Europe, every single country, you know, whether it's Switzerland or Finland or Iceland, you know, as far flung as there, they all have different stories, which all seem to have the same undertones and descriptions of the similar creatures, which really makes you wonder. It begs the question, were these things real at one point? It's true. Yeah, I, I just remember reading an article a couple months ago about uh, unicorns and that <laughs> there might have actually been a creature that was looked like a horse, but had kind of like a rhinoceros um, a horn that would make it look like a unicorn. So some people actually might think that might have been the very basis of what a unicorn was. Well, that's fascinating. But uh, in truth, unicorns are actually goats. And really? e even today, unicorns exist. And I'm not talking about the horse with the single horn, but... Mm -hmm. You, if you look at the old uh, heraldry coat of arms and things like that, all the the old symbols and the the family crests and almost like the the royal crest for Great Britain, in fact, has a unicorn and a lion. But uh, if you go back really further back, uh, the unicorn was actually a goat. It has sort of fur on its ankles. The hooves are cloven, not like a horse, um, and it has a little sort of beard on its chin, like a goat. And if you just look at it as a goat, that's exactly what it is. Mm -hmm. And through several, uh, you know, crossbreeding and, and uh, experts in, in the whole genetics of breeding animals, people ha have and do develop goats with one single horn. It's quite thick and wide, but it's a central horn and uh, they're white, of course. And so on first glance, oh, my God, there's a unicorn. And that's that's ex exactly what they are. It's interesting. That's really interesting. So... 
into the coloring book itself, which was your favorite one to draw? Like, what did you have the most fun with? Uh, I know it's, I know it's probably a tough Griver. Question. Griver? Griler. Griler. Now, uh, can you give me a little bit of background information on what the Griler is? Well, Griler is very much a sort of, uh, almost like a female version of Krampus. Mm. Um, she's, she's an ogre. She's a big troll. Uh, an ogress, uh, a large, ugly lady, almost like a witch ogre, who lives in caves up in the mountains. And throughout the year, she'll collect the names of all the naughty children. And at Christmas time, she'll come out of her cave down into the villages and collect all the children. And then she'll take them all the way back up to the cave in the mountains, put them in a huge cauldron and cook them as a stew, and then eat them, quite simply as that. Wow. Um, so again, it was to ensure children were behaved or they didn't wander off in the snow, you know. Um, and those that did and went missing and died or, you know, were found dead, it was told that they'd been either gotten by the Gryler or, or something else. Um, and Gryler actually has a, a pet, a large cat, which if you didn't uh, have new clothes for the winter, then the cat would, you know, sniff you out with your rags and you're good enough to eat. Uh, but if you had new clothes, it would leave you alone. And that was purely created to sort of ensure people were uh, knitting and, and, you know, sewing new clothes for the whole community. It was to encourage people, uh, even adults, not just children. You know, if, you, if you're wearing shabby clothes, that giant cat in the mountains is going to get you. Um, but Gryla, yeah, she, you know, there's so many different descriptions of her. It was actually tricky to decide which way to portray her because some descriptions talk of her having three heads and a single eye in each head, um, almost like Greek mythology. You know, it mm. seems to sort of have that, that feel, um, fantastic creatures. But um, the most common one is, is she's she's like an old hag or a witch, but an ogre, really big, uh, goat's legs and 13 tails, I don't know. Wow. She's supposed to have 13 sons, uh, the 13 Yule lads. Um, and they're sort of trolls as well, you know, that kind of thing. And she's on she's on her third husband. So there's a lot of um, threes and thirteens going on. Mm -hmm. Really interesting. That was the most fun indeed. Sounds fantastic. So um, I'm going to go into a little bit more of your career. You've worked with um, uh, several people around the music industry uh, designing yeah. art for, um, uh, I would say, like the heavy metal genre or the metal yeah. genre in general. Yeah. Um, uh, one of those, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, Iron Maiden and Rob Zombie. You that's work, two of them. That's, that's, <laughs> two, that's two of them. And those two, <laughs> no slouches themselves in that industry at all. Um, what is it about kind of like, because this is like, to use like kind of like slang, this is a pretty metal book. This is a pretty like metal okay. like, coloring book. <laughs> so what is it about kind of like the metal genre or industry that makes it kind of like so appealing to have this like gothic horror like depicted in uh, your art? Um, depicted in my art? Um, I think, you know, it all goes hand in hand. Um, I've always said that throughout my career as an artist, whether I'm creating for album sleeves or comic books, everything's sort of connected. Um, horror movies, uh, you know, I, I work with Clive Barker occasionally, I'll illustrate some of his books. And, you know, a lot of horror films have rock music soundtracks. And a lot of rock music albums have horrific artwork. So it really all goes hand in hand. Um, and it's just a question of taste, I think. Um, you know, people ask, do I draw kittens or bowls of fruit? And no, you know, to, <laughs> no. to me, that's boring. To me, that's boring. Uh, you Occasionally, uh, you'll see things on Instagram or, you know, Facebook of other artists who do these enormous paintings. And they're almost, um, I mean, they're photorealistic, but they, they are sort of... Uh, huge versions of someone's face but it has droplets of rain on it and it just looks like a photograph and to me that is the most pointless boring thing in the world you know congratulations you're a human camera that's that's just boring to me i like to see and, and create things that you don't see every day unusual things that uh, really inspire you maybe even give you nightmares or just expand your imagination a little bit more you know because um a lot of it's out there anyway, but people just choose to ignore it or they're unaware of it. Now, um, uh, do you have any like certain like artistic routines or like lay people like myself? Like I'm more of a writer, so I don't really uh, 
I don't. Really, I'm a terrible with drawing. But do you have anything that I would might consider like a quirk, like or a or a certain routine that's like a habit that you have every single time you approach like your sketchboard? Um, I I have to take about three or four days before I begin something to really think about it, and you know other artists will spend those days sketching and you know working things out and planning things and meticulously sort of getting it right before they execute the final thing. And I, I, I tend not to do that. I try to formulate everything in my head. Um, sometimes a client will say, you know, well, can we see some sketches? And I say, well, no, because you're probably not going to like the, the sketches because what you have in your head is the final product. And that's not what a sketch is, you know, uh, if you're with me. So to waste time on something like that, I'd, I'd, far, I'd far rather nail it in one go um so the preparation side is a good cup of tea with some honey um and to just sort of beam out for a few days and really think about all the different possible ways of doing something in your head so that when you finally execute it you know it's right instead of trial and error trial and error you know um no i'm not knocking sketches i mean i sketch every day but if it's per a particular thing then i have to know what that's going to be and i you know sketching it is just going to muddy the water i think yeah, it could, uh, it could, as you say, muddy the water of like the creative process. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, do you have any particular um, artists that you that you feel like you've been particularly inter uh, influenced by um, over your career? Yeah, um, I'm. Wow, uh, big fan of Clive Barker. Obviously, mm -hmm. um, I love Ashley Wood. Uh, he's he's a current contemporary genius. Um, Simon Bisley. Absolute legend, um, Leo Up, uh, and of course, you know, H.R. Geiger and Salvador Dali, uh, you know, all classics as well. You can't really fail, but you know, I love walking through galleries and museums and looking at the old school stuff. Um, that, that's really inspiring. But I think, you know, in terms of uh, influence and inspiration, to sort of see someone else do something and for it to work, uh, I think Simon Bisley is, is definitely one of those people that expanded the comic book style into a whole different, more raw, gritty, less clean way, you know, more of an art, traditional sense way of creating comic books and that kind of thing. So Simon Bisley is a huge influence, uh, fantastic artist. I'll have to check him out. So um, uh, I guess I'm going to move on to my very last question. Um, do you hmm. have anything coming down the pike um, in terms of future projects? Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> well, to follow the Christmas book uh, next year, I'll be releasing a Halloween version. That's so cool. it'll be much the same, uh, but all the different Halloween legends. And I can't wait because, again, everybody's favorite season is Halloween. So it's going to be interesting for me to sort of dig into that and find out things that I didn't know. Um, and we'll see just how dark Halloween can be. Yeah. So. If, hey, if it's as dark as Christmas, I'm going to buy my copy. <laughs> well, thank you. All right. So uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us. This is Mr. Sam Sheeran, and his book is Creepy Christmas, a Mary Macabre coloring book. So uh, please check it out. It's available online as well as um, in several stores. So um, uh, thank you so much for joining us, Mr. Sam. Well, thank you, Matt. Take uh, care. Yeah. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Merry Christmas and Happy New Year.